definitely didn't foresee this future 10 years ago. I mean, I, I generally did, but it's much more exciting than I could have predicted. Uh, we, I am opening up my lab. We are going to be a social media lab soon, which I think will be great because we do need to in, inspire students, young teenagers, especially those from backgrounds that don't even consider science as a career. Uh, so I'll be talking about this, but just as a preview, what we are doing in my lab is, uh, so we've got this ability to dial up aging in the forwards and reverse direction. We've got the ability to reprogram tissues to make them younger. We're looking at recovering memory uh, and the ability to learn in old mice. So far that's looking promising by, by changing the age of the brain. Uh, we're looking at skin, uh, spinal cord injury. We have other projects. We are looking at ways to protect the genome from damage and epigenetic changes. We have a protein that comes from very stress resistant and radi radiation resistant bacteria. That one's coming to fruition. Uh, we've looked at resveratrol in more detail than probably anyone cares to. Um, it, it was controversial because Pfizer basically attacked my science for whatever reason you can you can probably guess. But uh, you know that they said resveratrol doesn't doesn't act on Cert one the enzyme, uh, nor do the drugs we were developing. Well, you know they essentially screwed up that entire uh, field of medicine. Unfortunately, we're trying to revive it, but. Uh, what they didn't do was to crush the science, and uh, we prevailed, showing that resveratrol does activate SIR1. And the new study is to make, we made a mouse that doesn't get activated by resveratrol just by changing one amino acid in the enzyme. And we could test whether resveratrol has a benefit on those mice. Uh, and the answer is it doesn't. It's blocked by this SIR1 activation mutant, which to me really finally nails it. But, I, you know, I'll use this as a platform to tell you and, and your, your audience that once something, some idea gets out in the media, uh, it's really hard to reverse it. And I still meet people who say, oh yeah, all that stuff from your lab was BS when, you know, since 2013, it's been proven to be right in science and nature papers by, by us and others. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll continue moving on. There's nothing much you can do about public perception except do your best and do good research. In my lab, what it's like is if you come up with an experiment, you have to justify why it's important for the world. And why would anyone care? And we don't work the way a lot of labs do. Most labs say, well, we have this, this animal or this worm, and we have this technique of knocking those genes out. Let's just knock genes out in the worm. We don't do that. We, we sit back and we say, what are the big unsolved questions of humanity? And then we figure out how to solve that with new technologies and new models, which is really hard. In my lab, you've got to be brave because we it's, it's risky and you've just got to think on your feet. And often our papers have a lot of authors because we have to have expertise in pathology and machine learning and we've built our own computers. Uh, it takes a lot and I don't profess to know everything. So you have to be the world's expert in my lab at what you do. But uh, what's it like being a scientist? Well, it, it's thrilling to do something that is at the forefront of human knowledge. Um, when I was a graduate student, it was the best time of my life. It is stressful. It's a lot of work. You do have to work on weekends typically. Um, and it can be stressful when your projects fail or experiments fail. Uh, but no one in my lab has, has ever failed in the long run. And what you need to do is select a supervisor that ensures that you take calculated risks. So you could have a risky project, but also uh, a middle one and a really safe one just in case.